Hello and good evening to Wildlife for December 2021. And I'm incredibly excited about the theme that we're talking about in Wildlife uh, this evening, because it's all about communities taking action for nature. You know, this is one that personally really matters to me. And I was like really, really keen we had a wildlife focused on this issue because I've been in a very fortunate position to have been a professional environmental campaigner for 25 years now or something. You know, I get paid to do environmental campaigning. I'm very, very lucky to have that. But the interesting thing is, is across those 25 years of my professional environmental campaigning, guess what? Honestly, the people that have inspired me most have been the community campaigners right around the world, in this country, certainly, but also right around the world, who campaign to protect their local precious wild places, to improve their local environment, to stop road building schemes and appalling developments that are being forced upon them. And for me, emotionally, through my career, nothing has touched me more than working with these amazing uh, community campaigners. Someone described them sometimes as sort of ordinary people campaigning for the environment. But in my experience, there's nothing ordinary about them at all. They are perhaps extraordinary, ordinary people campaigning to protect the environment, protect their local wild places, to improve the environment and to improve their neighbourhoods and communities. And I've learned so much from over the years. And we really wanted to bring this to you tonight so that we can share and learn a little bit what it's like to be a community campaigner like that, to understand how they work, what motivates them, what drives them, the highs and lows, what it's like to win, what it's like not to win, and for these issues to just roll on and on and on for many years, and just see where it kind of the conversation takes us. And of course, as ever with wildlife, you can ask questions as well, direct uh, while this is being broadcast uh, to the panel. And I will try and get through as many of them as possible. We've had a fantastic turnout tonight. Uh, we know that because we've already had 100 questions submitted before we even start. So keep those questions coming and we will try and get them, get through them. But first of all, let me introduce you to our fantastic panel tonight. Uh, and we're, we're introduce them each in turn. First of all, I want to introduce Julian Hoffman, who's uh, the author of the wonderful, wonderful book, Irreplaceable, which I was very fortunate to read uh, last year uh, when I was a judge on the Wainwright Prize. And in fact, Irreplaceable became uh, the uh, highly commended uh, award for the Wainwright Prize last year. It is such a beautiful book telling the story of exactly this, lots of community campaigners around the world in many places fighting to save their local places. And I thought it'd be wonderful to have Julian join us tonight to give some reflections on the observations he's made as he's gone around visiting lots of different community campaigners. Then we have Catherine Lindstrom, who's Friends of Gwent Levels. I'm sure you'll be very familiar with the amazing story about the community campaign to stop the M4 being built across Gwent Levels. And Catherine, delighted you could join us tonight to tell us a little bit more about that incredibly successful campaign. We've got David Dickinson from Sheffield Environmental, which is there. It was originally set up as a Facebook page in 2015 and since then has been uh, supporting and campaigning with people uh, in and around Sheffield to try and make the world a cleaner, greener place, but particularly has been focused on trying to raise awareness about hen harrier and raptor persecution. We've got Stu Bennett, no relation, I have, have to say, but Stu Bennett is someone that's really inspired me a few years ago when I went and visited Liverpool and uh, heard about this appalling scheme to try and put a dual carriageway right through this incredibly important urban park in North Liverpool. And we're going to be hearing more about that as we go on tonight. And then we have Trish Evans from wild.ng. Uh, that's doing this amazing work around street by street campaigning and efforts to put to develop nature recovery plans street by street in Nottingham. Uh, and we're going to be hearing a lot about more from that from Trish this evening. So a great variety of different types of community campaigns, different issues that we will go through tonight as we discuss this. So that's your amazing panel for this evening. I'm going to kick off by going to Julian first of all, really. And Julian, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I'm rather jealous you join us from northwest Greece, don't you, where you live near the 
Crespo Lakes, I think. That's right. That's right. High up in the mountains and there's a heck of a storm brewing. So hopefully I can stay on the line long enough this evening. But yes, I'm right up in the far northwest corner of Greece, looking down over the Prespa Lakes, which in summer will be covered with two species of pelicans. That's probably the flagship species of the area. Well, uh, Julian, I am so pleased you can join us tonight. And I, I am just going to start by embarrassing you and saying how much I really love your book, Irreplaceable, The Fight to Save Our Wild Places. You know, when I read it in uh, last year, I mean, I just I, I just completely connected with it. I think for anyone who works in this field, for anyone who's done sort of community campaigning, they will get so much from it. And I just recognise so many of the sort of stories you were telling and the emotions you were telling. And I think you do a beautiful job, job with this book in that you sort of like guide people around. You, you, you know, we, we go on a journey with you, meeting these amazing campaigners and going to these uh, places. And you do it in a very humble way. And it's, it's just such a lovely book. And I can't recommend it enough for people to read it. That's Irreplaceable by uh, Julian Hoffman. Um, Julian, tell me, given that you've visited lots of these uh, community campaigners and lots of amazing wild places that they're fighting to protect what do you what what would you say that you've detected as the sort of some of the commonalities between them what makes a really good uh you know community campaigner what what what, what is the what are sort of the the qualities that you perhaps yeah. have spotted time and again so firstly, I would just like to say a huge thank you both for your very, very kind and generous words, but also for the wonderful invite to be here this evening from Northern Greece, but amongst other campaigners. And in reply to your question, Craig, what I should very, very briefly first say is that this was never the book I intended to write. And it was because of campaigners that I have to thank for this book in itself, really. I was planning on writing a completely and utterly unrelated book to this one. But I was sent a message by a campaigner in the North Kent, from the North Kent marshes off the Thames Estuary asking if I would be interested in seeing a place that was threatened. And I happened to have a single day spare in my schedule that week while I was in London. And I thought, I'll go and see this story, a part of the, a part of the country that I'd never been to before, bizarrely, even though I'd lived in London for years and years and years. And I thought there was perhaps some scope for telling the story and the threat that the North Kent marshes of the Hoop Peninsula were under was to build Europe's largest airport, a plan that of course was backed by London's then mayor and now prime minister of the country, Boris Johnson. And that day in the presence of three local campaigners who weren't professional conservationists in any sense, they weren't trained ecologists, I truly understood what loss meant. I truly, for the very first time, despite being an ardent bird watcher, despite walking hills and mountains and meadows, wherever I am, I finally understood what that kind of collective cumulative loss really means when we strip out the richness, these rich seams of life and places from our local surroundings. And they showed me really what we stand to lose as a society, as communities, as individuals. And it was that day, and it was a day of great sort of early April winds and snow and listening to these passionate warm voices of three people, three residents, that I decided perhaps I needed to write a very different book and to tell the story of these places that often go under the radar. And I very, very quickly started thinking of a book and I began bizarrely by typing the single word save into a number of um, platforms, petition, web-based pla uh, petitions, um, change.org, for example, and a lot of things come up with save, but suddenly dozens and then dozens more and then hundreds of campaigns began appearing. Save this lake, save this meadow, save this wood, save this community garden, save this allotment, save this marshland, save this estuary. And these stories are unfolding, these potential losses are unfolding right around the world. They're not confined solely to the United Kingdom. They're not confined solely to Europe. They literally happen everywhere from Indonesia to Australia to South America to Glasgow. So I thought I should just start with that because that was the story I realized. It was because of three campaigners that I wanted to tell these stories. And that led me on a very, very long journey over the course of six years that it took to write and research this book. But it opened for me 
an extraordinary world of potential and possibility because I think often what's missing from the larger discussion of environmental issues is a very, very critical kind of abundance. And that is the abundance of the local, the familiar and the intimate. And these are our connecting points. These are where local communities truly, truly connect with the wild world. And once we remove those places, we strip out a whole host of other possibilities and potential. We strip away the future because of course, people coming following generations would never know that those places are there. I probably haven't actually answered your question at this point, but I thought it was worthwhile giving you that sort of background of what the journey began for me and where it kind of led. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, thank you very much for that. It is great to get that summary uh, there, Julian. Um, but, but what I do find fascinating, what I found fascinating about your book is, is so often what we hear about with these campaigns it is, of course, the campaigns, it's the issues, it's the roads they're fighting or the airports that's being fought or the, the attempts to try and uh, stop a mine or whatever. Yeah. Um, what you did in the book is also talk about those communities and those individuals, actually, that are running those campaigns. What, what for you came out? time and again you know what were the common themes that for you as you went to lots of different communities and met these community campaigners what what shone through for you I mean there's one well there's a, few, a number of, of primary themes I suppose but one that I keep coming back to I suppose is that each and every and like you'd mentioned earlier these were all extraordinary ordinary people you know they were publicans they were um, baristas they were soldiers they were school teachers they were nurses well, you know they all had very ordinary lives. But each and every one of them, and I can't strive this enough, I suppose, they had each enlarged the idea, their understanding of what home meant. So home moved out, it was enlarged from just the bricks and mortar structure they lived with to include the green spaces in their midst, to include the communities of wild creatures, creatures sorry, that they lived alongside. And I think that's really critical to remember because so much of our fundamental crises that we live amidst right now are ultimately about a separation. They're about distinctiveness. They're about us removing ourselves or believing that we can remove ourselves from the natural world. And most of these, all of these campaigners, sorry, they had, they had reaffirmed that home for them was this enlarged idea so that it included so much more. And through that, that kind of kinship with place and that idea of reciprocity between the human and the wild can really be very nurturing. And that was sort of, I suppose, brought home in many ways by the nature of the really, really successful campaigns. And I covered a lot for across the world, but the very finest had diversity at the core because place in itself is often a very, very diverse idea you know, it incorporates different human communities, but also wildlife communities. And so to, to forge a diversity, a spectrum of people within a coalition that's fighting to save any particular place is a wonderful way to not only replicate the natural diversity, but it also strengthens the community itself. And when I talk about that, it's about, about bringing within the community, sorry, with bringing within the campaign itself, people of different ages, people of different ethnicities, people often of different political beliefs. Because when we talk about community, we sometimes get a little bit too hung up on the commonality aspect of it. But community fundamentally also has to be about compromise. There can be truly no community without finding ways of bridging di differences. And that was one of the really great lessons that I learned, I suppose, with these varied communities. that They'd found ways to be as inclusive as possible because that, first of all, brought forward a far, far better um, stance to, to the campaign. But it actually made the community a much more strong idea extraordinary extraordinary julian love that i could i could listen to you talking about that all night uh let me just give you one final question you obviously met some really interesting characters through those travels and some sort of quite eccentric people uh in some ways um and there was that absolute diversity there um but, you know, what do you think drives, you know, driving these people? What are the sort of skills they pull out? I mean, how do they learn on the job or do they have them already? Or is it all of the above? It's, it's probably all of the above. And, you know, I met people who had 
who might somebody who might have been a trained school teacher but become a, a phenomenal scholar of hydrology of marshland hydrology and the way the way um, wetland ecosystems function. Uh, you know, I met people who had versed themselves in the intricacies of environmental law, you know, become specialists in so many realms. But one thing that became very, very clear for me is that a lot of it was founded on love. And we sometimes don't talk about this enough, really, in many environmental discussions, but mm. grief and love, I would argue, are the two sides of the same coin. It's um, it's impossible to have one without the other, or at least it's impossible to have one without the possibility of the other. And what the loss of, the potential loss of places and wild species in the midst of communities, it often brought about a great deal of grief for people, the trauma of potentially losing places that people were deeply, deeply attached to, that they loved. But what grief also does, the possibility of grief, the possibility of loss, is it enables us to recognize the possibility of love itself and how it can be fiercely protective in character. You think of a wild animal or a human, you know, seeking to protect its family. It's no different when we talk about these anchoring places and the wildlife in our midst, because a lot of these people were acting out of a deep, deep, deep sense of love for these places that we're set to be lost. Julian, I can so relate uh, to everything you've said there. And it's uh, perhaps a sort of perhaps observers like you and me that look in on these communities. It's, it's a deeply humbling experience, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I learned, you know, I, I set out on this journey, not truly knowing what I would experience. And it was ultimately the most joyous of my professional career. But it was also the one that taught me the most about mm. so many different things. And I remain forever grateful to the many, many people along the way during those six years who showed me, who showed me a different way of being, who showed me that there are possibilities and countless ways that we can correct and reaffirm our connection to the natural world. Julian, thank you so much. I mean, we'll be coming back to you later for further discussion, obviously. Right. But I think um, we'll move on now and then peer into uh, some examples of these incredible communities and the campaigners there. And uh, your focus on sort of a grief and love there is the perfect segue into our first <laughs> person we're meeting tonight, Stu Bennett uh, from uh, Save Rimrose Valley campaign in uh, northern Liv Liverpool. And Stu, in fact, we can see the love heart, the green love heart behind you for I love uh, RV, which I'm sure means Rimrose <laughs> Valley. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> means Rimrose Valley as opposed to a recreational vehicle or something like that. <laughs> um, but Stu, fantastic to see you again. Uh, you are certainly one of the people that's really inspired me the last few years. I think I first met you, whatever it was, three, four years ago when I popped up to Rimrose Valley. In fact, I was giving a, I was giving a speech in Liverpool uh, and uh, someone, one of your community came up and gave me a flyer uh, which had a certain map on it. And I was so shocked by it, I decided next time I came to Liverpool, I really had to find out more about Rimrose Valley and visit and, and learn a bit more about it. But I'll let you tell the story about, first of all, tell us, what, where is Rimrose Valley? What is it? And why is it special? Yeah, uh, and thanks very much for having us. Um, um, Rimrose Valley is in, in North Liverpool, so it's in the Liverpool city region. Um, it's in the borough of Sefton. Um, and it's about well, maybe six miles outside the city centre. Um, but where we live is, is really heavily urbanised. We're right next to the port of Liverpool, which I'm sure we'll discuss uh, shortly. But um, yeah, it's very built up. There's um, surrounded by major roads. Uh, there's a lot of heavy industry in the port as well. So um, Rimrose Valley is an oasis in amongst all of that chaos. Um, and it sort of sits right in amongst uh, people's houses, but next to schools, children's centres. You can um, see it there on the photos. I mean, it really is beautiful. I mean, look at that. I mean, just to, to have that in the middle of a big uh, urban environment. And, and Stu, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but it's astonishing because it's also what I find amazing. It was essentially sort of created in a way, wasn't it? Or established, we could say, in the late 1990s. That's right, isn't it? That's it. Yeah, I mean, sector, the, look, Rimrose Valley itself has changed uh, in terms of land use for over 
over decades and centuries. But no, um, up until the 70s and 80s, it was, it was landfill sections of the lower part of it. Um, and that's what amazes me, really. Some people actually, actually you, uh, deride it because of that. But for me, it demonstrates that what nature can do as soon as she sort of takes hold and, and just attracts new species. I mean, um, some of the other the, 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 the things in terms of... I'm, I'm, and I think it's a really important point that I'm no ecologist either. I just love nature. Um, and Rimrose has become a magnet for um, species. Uh, we've got a barn, owl, barn owls, water voles on the Leeds Liverpool Canal, canal which uh, is just to the uh, the east of the park. And we've it's now attracted roe deer as well. So if you're up and out running early, um, you, you you could encounter some of them. I've not been fortunate enough to do that myself, but no, it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful place. And it and it fulfills two roles really. It, it, it's nature on people's doorstep. As I say, we, we are very built up. It doesn't look like it on some of the nice pictures we're sharing, but if you spin the camera around, you'll see how built up it is around here. Car ownership is low, um, so it's, it is countryside in our community and it gives people access to nature. But it also fulfills, as I say, another role, which is to connect communities. People don't jump in the car to go and see their auntie, uncle, grandparents. They walk across the park. Um, and the road proposal fundamentally ignores that you know that the, the, the both the nature aspect and also the, the the community cohesion part and so we'll come on to the road proposal in a second Stu but there's just also another thing that became clear when um uh, you know actually I visited is just how much it's used by local school schools as well it's a hugely important sort of outdoor classroom for local schools isn't it with Mose Valley yeah, it's amazing. Um, we've got, we work as a campaign and as a charity, we, we work with a number of local schools. And indeed, one of our trustees um, is, is a teacher in, in the local primary school. I remember you met Sarah when you came to do the, the Wish Tree event. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of certain primary schools and stuff have built it into their curriculum where they, they go out of the classroom, they go for a ramble on Rimrose and look at what they can see. Um, and they know what, what I find amazing about um, uh, school children and even primary school children or perhaps especially for primary school children is that they know what Rimrose is all about it's about clean air it's about nature it's about peace and quiet and tranquility um, and yeah that we, we take it we take a lot of inspiration from our schools and school children so it's a very very special place for your local community and then a few years ago along come highways England uh, with a certain proposal, don't they? And I think we've got a picture of the the map showing the the roads proposal from Highways England that would be useful to have up there. We have it, and this was what you showed me when I first came up to Liverpool. And and you know, as soon as you see this, you see that you see that sort of beautiful stretch of green that is Rimrose Valley through through the grey of northern Liverpool, as it were. And you can see that someone somewhere has thought, oh, that'd be a very handy place to put a road. So what's exactly. all that about, Stu? What's the, I mean, it's shocking, isn't it? What's what's the road for? What's the tell us about the proposal? Yeah, so if you look at the the, the lower half of that map, you'll see uh, a certain port of Liverpool, um, and as I said, that's based in Sefton, um, and the project itself is called the, the A five zero three six Port of Liverpool Access Scheme. So the clue's in the name. It's it's being proposed to uh, improve access to and from the port of Liverpool. This is a very active port, and um, they've got big plans for growth. They want to increased by 300% post Brexit that there's more trade um, and the we, we know from freedom of information requests that they've lobbied government for a, a solution to the, the infrastructure it's interesting how the port was allowed to expand to, to accept bigger ships and um, yet nobody in the central government gave a thought to how the infrastructure that was needed to support it so in 2017 our communities were given two options which can loosely be termed bad and worse uh, one was to redevelop the existing route, the A5036, so widen sections of a route which is already suffering the effects of pollution um, and noise and, and all of the, the negative things that come with a busy road. Or well, the other was to bulldoze a country park. So we've learned from engaging with other campaign groups and, uh, and NGOs uh, like um, Transport Action Network that this is a tried and trusted tactic of National Highways or Highways England as was. It's divide and conquer, pit communities against each other, promise one a better future, promise another a worse one. And, and we're still mat trying to handle the effects of that because um, I don't know if it'll come up in anybody else's campaign, but they can be quite divisive things campaign. There's, it's, it's not always a unified front, but 
what we what we try and do is is what what we're trying to do as a campaign is look for a solution which protects our country park because you're right they've just looked at a space of of green and drawn a line through it um and alleviates the conditions of those living alongside the existing route and, and that is possible it just needs some vision and those in the department for transport to acknowledge that there's a problem here and you're not going to fix it by another another road yeah there is something very wrong isn't there now society or our economy that that you know planners will will look at a map see a nice green bit of space and think oh that's a that's the easiest place to put a road um quite ex- astonishing Stu. let me just ask you then a bit more personally how did you personally first get involved in this let's hear about your personal journey what what made you sort of sit up and get involved in 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 this and you know what what sort of yeah well tell us that to start with yeah, well, because of where Rimrose Valley is located, um, uh, hundreds, thousands of people now are, are members of, of, our, of our community Facebook group, Rimrose Valley Friends. Um, and I use the park on a regular basis. Funny enough, um, my daughter was born and, and the second she came home, we took her for walks on the park. And I just, just to drown the, make the screaming sound less loud. But um, I got, to, I got to, to know it through using it that way. Um, and I just just appreciate it for open green space. I don't know if anybody's picked up on it, but I'm, ado- I'm an adoptive scout, so I'm from North Wales originally. And green space was a given for me where I grew up. I'm not, I wasn't from Rolling Hills or, or anything like that, but there was fields all around. And when I moved to North Liverpool, I, I really sought out green space. So I cared about it in that way. And then when the road proposal was announced, um, the, the, the then committee, the charity com- uh, uh, committee, put a shout out on so- social media. And I was one of a number of people that responded. And I'd say since then, um, we've had a, people have come and gone, but we've got a core team of about 12, 15 people um, who have been active ever since. Um, and I'd never done anything like this before. Since, same is true for many of those in our campaign team. We were just united by a common goal, which was to protect a place we love. And we might all love it for different reasons, um, but we want to fight for its future. What are the skills you say you've learned on the way? I mean, what are the skills you felt you brought to this from the start that you already had? And what are the skills you've learned along the journey? Well, the, the good thing about having a, 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 a team which is representative of, of, of the community is that everybody brings their own skills to, to the party. We've got great event organisers. We've great, got people who are great with media and stuff like that. But I suppose if I, if I was talking practically, I mean, I've, I've done a variety of jobs in, in the past and, and one of them was like a project management role. And this is essentially another project um, it's one with no end date really and um, we don't really know what the result's going to be but um, I love a spreadsheet and um, spreadsheets kind of rule my, uh, rule my life and, and I think if anything it's just a little bit of organisation um, I do uh, you know I've, 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 I like communicating the issues I, 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 try, I think input, being diplomatic is, is vital because you need to bring the community with you and I think us as a campaign because we're, we're from the community we, we've been able to formulate our arguments which reflect the communities because that's vital. It wouldn't work if it was one person saying, this is what I think. Um, so, yeah, we all use our different skills. Uh, and I think, well, I'm really proud of the progress we've made over the last four years and counting. So uh, final question, though, Stu, for now. It, it's not one yet, is it, sadly? it's uh, You're still fighting it for the moment. Yeah. No, it's, it's not one, but um, I take a massive amount of encouragement from the fact that this, this project is now four years behind schedule. They should yeah. have started construction in 2020. Yeah. Um, and that's not just COVID. That's not just um, a judicial review, which our council brought, which sadly was unsuccessful. There is something fundamentally wrong with this proposal. And they are scratching their heads, trying to work out how they can force through this toxic scheme, which benefits nobody except the poor. Um, what we are doing, as I say, I'm, I'm convinced that we can stop this. And I hope I'm not speaking to you in, in four years' time or whatever it is, sort of looking back on, 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 on a negative outcome. But I'm convinced that we're going to win this and everyone in our campaign team is too. Well, fantastic. Well, I, Stu, I mean, it cannot be allowed to happen. It's just as simple as that. It's just so shocking. I mean, if, if they build that road through Wimose Valley, you know, then that's not kind of what what the uk should be like in the 21st century it will just it's just absolutely appalling indictment of old world thinking going on and uh you know we've got to stop it somehow it's just but you are doing an amazing job you and your 
community there campaigning on that. And I think it'd be very interesting to hear from Catherine in a bit, the comparisons between what you're doing and the campaign Catherine did on the stopping the M4 going through the Gwent levels. But we'll come to that in a little while. Uh, Stu, thanks very much for now. Uh, we'll be coming back to you uh, later. I'm going to go now to uh, Trish Evans with Wild.ng. Uh, Trish, along with artist and naturalist Nick Humphreys, founded Arts Partnership in store in 2013, an endeavour that was entirely focused upon creating deeper connections to the natural world through contemporary art. But then Instar established Wild.ng in their city of Nottingham in 2020, bringing together a group of local residents and passionate advisors to make a positive change for wildlife in their city. Trish, tell us a bit more about Wild NG. You were telling me earlier, you know, really the way you describe it is, is a, a projects to, to, to work street by street on creating sort of a nature recovery plan at that level. Uh, it sounds a fascinating initiative. And, and, and how did you get started in it? What, uh, what made you decide this is what we need to be doing? Are you on mute? Oh, there we are. Right. You know? Yeah, you great. Thank yeah, you. Brilliant. Um, that's a really great question. Um, interestingly, just hearing from Stu just now about, you know, it seems to have really got a tangible space to save it feels that that's where the campaign can be drawn from. And we're looking more at how we can save our urban nature, which sometimes is really under the radar. And as local residents, we felt there was something that really needed to happen in our city. Um, about four or five years ago, myself and Nick, we set up Swift Street, which was a sort of street by street model where we engaged streets and our communities and neighbours to install Swift boxes on their residential properties. And through that, we ended up connecting as a community. You know, it's a really nice way of sort of getting to know who we are and working together to make a change. But also, um, we recognise an appetite. We could see in our local area that there's something here that could really happen. And we wanted to see how we could create a project that could really make a difference in our city and change sort of the way that we manage green spaces. And to do that, we wanted to put the power back into our our position as residents and um, through nature connect together and make a difference um, so that's where it sort of the nugget came from but what we did is we got a bunch of us together who live locally across a certain area alongside and we worked a little bit with Knott's Wildlife Trust as well and we had these sort of meetings to decide how we could set up this model so um, yeah we put our heads together and looked at a boundary area and then went for it with looking at how we can set up ourselves up with a plan of engagement and our approach really was very much about positive opportunities to take notice of nature first and foremost to recognize it's there that we may need to well we do need to save it but we also need to restore it and also how we in our patch can do that and so it's about sort of growing that collective energy and that strength and that sort of collaborative approach and we are really, I feel kind of like really honored to be here because we're only a year old with Wild NG. Um, but we've really had attraction, we've really had an impact. It's grown significantly. And that's really down to the to the passion that we've got around us in our community. But also, you know, if people start to listen and to hear and to discover, and everything we do is is free, it's voluntary. Someone asked us recently, you know, how are you funded? Well, we're not. This is purely down to just passion and love and care and grief, as Junior mentioned, which really rung a bell. So, you know, all of those things really fueled us coming together and we're really enjoying it. It's been really great. And we've got our, our, a number of campaigns happening, but one specific one that's really happening now, which we've managed to influence our council through a bit of creative pressure to um, pilot glyphosate street, glyphosate free streets. So poison free pavements campaign is what we've launched. So, Really, really for people that aren't familiar with glyphosate, just uh, yeah. say a little bit more about what glyphosate is. It's not the kind of thing you want to have in your your drink at Christmas, is it? No, it's not. It is. Um, it's a poison, essentially. And we've spoke about it in that language, to be honest. We feel we need to do that. It's sprayed on our streets in Nottingham at least twice um, a year and it kills everything it kills the plant but also then of course that impacts on insects that are affiliated to those plants and that green space it, it obliterates the whole green area and it's pretty it's toxic 
um, and it is affiliated to human health and well-being and public health as well as the health of nature. And um, so it's really, really impactful and we really, really want it stopped. But what's interesting is that our community don't know it's even being sprayed. So we've used analogies that are very personal to us. For example, you know, with my son walking home from primary school when he's picked up a dandelion and, and brought it up to his nose, we didn't know if it'd been sprayed that day. That's not great, is it? So it's sort of really understanding firstly how we can celebrate and love our nature where we live, but how we can look at far more healthier and more beautiful ways and more positive ways that we can, in a way, take care of nature on our streets. So it's about playing and, and converting our understanding of what is wild and what is tidy and, and starting to sort of change perhaps perspectives of nature where we live. Um, so yeah, lots of things happening there. So it's, it's really interesting, but yeah, we really are looking forward to this pilot, which is gonna be quite a big job for us as volunteers, but we're, we've got an interesting model to work towards that and we'll see how we go. Well, you've certainly made a big impression on us at the Wildlife Trust in your first year, Trish, for sure, which is why we wanted you to come along and join us tonight. What would you say you've learned most in that first year, you know, be it skills or just perspectives? I think myself and Nick and others actually in our group are pretty creative. And I think we wanted to get quite an identity together to, to, to really give a, a, a really beautiful and very positive mm. um, sense of place. And, and to really sort of, re, you know, sort of put that on the pedestal, or, you know, our, our local wildlife. So we've spent quite a lot of time with the way that we've presented what we've done. And I think that's really helped. So we didn't just rush into our campaign and our project and go, great, Wild NG, NG being our postcard, postcode, by the way. But, you know, we didn't want to sort of just promote that and just get it out there. We wanted to create it first and think carefully about how we did it. And then we went, we did a live stream. It was, someone referred to it as a bit like the one show. It was kind of... <laughs> It was a bit bonkers, but it really did help. I mean, what we did was we filmed all of our team separately to share their story locally. And that helped give a sense of place, which is really important for our project. So people could recognise localities and even recognise people. And I think that that really helped fuel the appetite for the project. Whereas I think if it had been generic, it wouldn't have really had that resonation. Mm -hmm you know, it wouldn't have had that impact. So I think that sort of creativity and that platform has really been good. And I think the other thing is we've been really open and honest and human. We are people, we are residents. We are not telling you how you should do things. We're saying, hey, let's network through nature. Let's, let's really make a difference and we can all do it, however small. And that I think has really helped our campaigning. And, you know, we're at a point now we've got about 80 wilder streets registered, which really indicates wow. us. And we've done hedgehog mapping where people have identified hedgehogs. So it's it's very much a, a sense of like, if you don't join, you're losing out. You know, let's look at our streets and let's network. And, and you know, that's that's been really interesting. And things like our volunteering is for all ages. We don't really mind who joins, you're all welcome. So that diversity angle that Julia mentioned really, really rings true with our approach. Great. Well, Trish, thank you so much for uh, telling us about that tonight. It does sound absolutely amazing that you've managed to do that all in the space of a year. Uh, there's clearly a lot of energy being put into that. So uh, we thank you so much. Um, we we'll come back to you in a little while for a bit more of a discussion. And we, we're getting the comments in here. We've got Judy Doherty has said, poison free payments. How can you argue with that? Absolutely right. She says, what a great initiative, Trish. So, uh, and we've had some brilliant comments coming in tonight, I have to say. Um, Julian, you'll be pleased to know, Nikki Rivers said, Irreplaceable, it's a fabulous book. I really recommend it. Annabelle said, I'm certain that we all have somewhere irreplaceable. That is to each of us, local, familiar, and intimate. Sam Murphy says, so interesting, I'm going to read this book. And Papa Smurf has said, I've just put Irreplaceable on my Christmas list. There we go. So, uh, <laughs> and as Simon says, a good point here. I completely agree. It's ridiculous that we have to fight for these things when they're in the interests of the whole planet. And Tammy said, totally agree. Grief and love drive um, and always have the feeling of standing up for nature. If you read historic accounts of the burning of the fens, grief illustrates the love of their fens. Alan Cargill has said developments should put nature first. Annabelle said uh, in response to you, Stu, that people absorb the walk across the valley 
as part of their lives and that this paradise was at once landfill. Quite astonishing. Uh, Papa has also said, put Rimrose Park into Google Earth and just see that this is the lungs of those houses on both sides. Brilliant, uh, brilliant stuff. Alan has said, thanks for the info on highways, divide and conquer. We will check that out and our proposed developments with new roads around the country parks. And uh, uh, Davine has said, Davine Wallace has said, great stew to see such fantastic community support for a much needed uh, green space. Uh, another comment so enthused by all this energy and passion so there we are keep them coming in loads of comments are coming in tonight today and loads of questions we'll get to them uh we're going to turn next though to david dickinson of sheffield environmental uh lead campaigner there originally set up as a facebook page in 2015 and the group's aim is to promote and support those working in the sheffield area to make the world a cleaner greener space but David has been a key voice in raising awareness in particular around uh, hen harrier and raptor pers persecution. Dave, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, not so much just a place on this, but a species as well. Tell us tell us a bit more. What, what got you involved and motivated about this, first of all? Yeah, oh, well, yeah, where do I start? Um, I've always been passionate about wildlife. I've got a degree in environmental conservation didn't get the job, uh, ended up in other lines of work. And, but I've always had that passion for rewilding, how the countryside's lost so many species. Um, we're even losing them now, which is ridiculous. Um, and, well, I... Around 2014, I was bouncing around, sort of not knowing what I was doing with my passions, really. I got involved with this group looking after some model boats, and that didn't go so well. And the Hen Harry Day movement started, and I was involved in this model boats exhibition. And the guy forgot the keys, and so we ended up being locked out of it for, uh, in the pouring rain. Um, meanwhile, Chris Packham and Mark Avery were leading Hen Harry Day with the Sodden 570. And I was constantly wishing for pretty much the rest of that year, I wish I'd have gone along to it. I should have been there. Um, anyway, later that, well, end of that year, the next year, I ended up in a relationship with this lass. And she was like, why don't you get back into conservation? Why don't you get back into conservation? And, well, I've been working outside the field for four or five years. I couldn't just jump straight back into it. So I set up the Facebook page and I picked various campaigns to support. One being Hen Harrier Day, one being Space Recycling, um, Smithy Wood, which Julie Hoffman writes about in Irreplaceable really well. And... So, yeah, I went along to these events and got to Hen Harrier Day and just seeing how well it went and how other people are so passionate about it. And really discovering how we should have so many of them on our, our, well, most of our doorsteps. I mean, just up the hill, up that way, they can potentially live up there and just over the hill. But yet, I'd never seen one in my life at that point. Well, roll, uh, roll on the next year when I was I went to the second Hen Harry Day of mine, met Natalie Bennett, um, been to other protests in Sheffield, seeing how the media came along to them, and just really feeling like we can do something to really push this into the public eye more. Um, then the year after, I, because I was organising Smithy World Litter Picks at this point, and I was have, uh, I always took a break at the beginning of August from, from the litter picking to focus on supporting Hen Harrier Day because it's such a big cause, rewilding the countryside, getting species back that are just so heavily persecuted. And I, it was getting close to the time, it was May. And I, so 
that's just sent a tweet to Birds Against Wildlife Crime. What's happening with the uh, Hen Harrier Day in the Peak District this year? The reply came back that there wasn't a Hen Harrier Day in the Peak District at this point in time. We're looking for volunteers to help. Ah, I thought that's a big hint. So I started putting together plans for a Sheffield Hen Harrier Day. And, and we can see from the photos, we saw some of the yeah. photos of that there. You, you got big numbers out, didn't you? A lot of people came out for it. Yeah, I mean, that was the second one, that mm-hmm. one that the two photos are for. Mm. Um, the, um, yeah, I mean, the thing as well with having it in the Peak District is that you're expecting a lot of people to travel out to the countryside with it. Whereas if you have it in a city centre and you've got it sort of with public transport going towards it and media tend to like to go into cities and so why not take the events to the media? Mm. And yeah, I... What were the main? What were the main sort of issues you're driving? I mean, what was the? Why was the persecution? Can you say a little bit more about why the persecution of Ben Harris was taking place? What's driving that? And you know, what would you like to see done about it? I'll bring in the Kaluna puppet here for that then. <laughs> um, hen Harriers have the most complete facial disc of any bird of prey, uh, so you can just see. I've actually got it put in, but around here. It's a bit like an owl face. And so that channels the sound like an ear. And it allows them to really hear the anything that's foraging in the undergrowth. And the fact that it's a predator as well, they're seen over a grouse more than the uh, grouse will ignore the beaters and either fly in the opposite direction to what the shooters want them to, or they'll hunker down more because they don't want to be get picked off. Um, also, that sound makes them really good at picking out different creatures in the undergrowth. And so, it, uh, well, they're really efficient at uh, catching prey, as shown by the fact that there should be, is it, thousand of them in the in England is it 300 uh the figures have gone from my head yeah uh, I've not been uh, campaigning as much on it because I've not yeah. been organizing the Hen Harry days because of COVID well I love the I love the puppet though Dave I must say well <laughs> fantastic so um uh, so you've obviously gained, you know, there's obviously been a lot of interest oh, yeah. in this and you've pulled people together on this mm-hmm. and, and what do you see as sort of the next steps on it we, we we need birds of prey to get the proper protection that they need. We need genuinely tougher sentences for the people that are proven to carry out these, these crimes. Um, get her out of the way, actually. She's <laughs> right in my face. And yeah, um, there's just so, I mean, like there's the big famous video clip of, a hen harrier flying by the camera and there's the ball of feathers go, uh, goes up and we see the gamekeeper there walking up to the carcass that's just off camera pushing the feathers to one side but we can't but that's not admissible as evidence that he's actually committed the crime yet to mm. anyone watching he's clearly shot it so why hasn't he been found guilty so you want to see proper sentences proper yeah. enforcement yeah um, all right um dave thank you very much it's uh you know it's a huge important topic and it's just it's been really inspiring to see how many people you've got involved in that so um thank you very much and we'll come back to you shortly in the in the wider kind of q a um but thanks so much and also for wheeling your friend in there <laughs> <laughs> I think helped help massively as well. Um, yeah. We'll move on now, if we can, to Catherine, Catherine Lindstrom, who ran the campaign to protect the Gwent levels from the 
the so-called M4 relief road that was planned across the Gwent levels. And uh, what's lovely here is, of course, ultimately this ends up being a story of a successful campaign, Catherine, very, very successful. Uh, and we thought it was very important to have one of those in here as well. Catherine, tell us the story. Tell us the story for those that don't know um, about the amazing campaign to save the Gwent levels. Again, told beautifully in Julian's book as well, Irreplaceable. Well, yeah, thank you for um, asking me to come here. And I'm just so impressed by the uh, diversity of campaigners and the passion that comes out in different different ways from, you know, the amazing stuff Trish is doing with just at a street level up to, you know, Julian talking about the international, the international dimension. And it's very sweet that you say that I ran the campaign. Um, I think some other people might say that they uh, were involved as well. I'd like to take full credit for it, but sadly, I can't. We were not only um, one focused campaign, but we were also a kind of umbrella group. I'm now co-chair of an organisation called Friends of the Gwent Levels. That was kind of born out of the success of um, the M4 Relief Road campaign, which was an organisation called campaign against the levels motorway calm which was itself a kind of umbrella organization so um for those who aren't familiar with it the m4 relief road was a kind of 19 1970s dream of welsh government of of road planners and obviously Stu is aware of the fact that that dream is alive and well with an awful lot of planners so they wanted to it was it was a it was a big vanity project really it was the idea of of the gateway to Wales and um, there's a particular bottleneck that goes through Newport and it was to ease this bottleneck the idea was to build 14 miles of motorway across the Gwent levels which is a wetland region um, almost unique in Wales of international significance for its biodiversity and what have you so um, the campaign started in about the 90, early 1990s and I got involved probably about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that. And I think it was an interesting process because I think like a lot of people, I thought, oh, my God, they want to build this motorway. I've got to stop it all on my own. What am I going to do? And then discovered that there were other people. There were other people who felt the same way as me. There were a lot of other people driven by those emotions that Julian talked about, driven by love driven by grief driven by that sense of impending loss and that was a huge relief for me to realize that I wasn't on my own and I think other people did the same thing they looked around and went oh there are more of us so it was a, it was a huge concerted effort by um, the wildlife trusts RSPB uh, Friends of the Earth and as well as community groups um, I might have missed somebody off um, it was a really tough battle and it went on for years, years and years, and the Welsh Government were determined to build this road. They threw everything at it. They spent millions and millions. I can't remember how much they actually spent trying to build the road. Um, and interestingly, they just wanted to mention again that idea of the passion. I think we found that that we were driven by love and passion and emotions. And we were confronted with this juggernaut of, of a desire for um, advancing the economy that was so scornful of our passion. And we found that in, there was a huge public inquiry which went on for months. And it was, it was a horrible David and Goliath event where we would go and we, we would we would sit you know almost like underneath a kind of comic book spotlight um, confronted with huge mass ranks of lawyers from the Welsh government who would question us and try and, and belittle us and find fault with our arguments and we weren't experts you know I, I had to do my homework and try and study things I knew nothing about like like road traffic accident data to try and find fault with their argument. And, and, and I was just there shaking, you know, under this spotlight and under this assault. So the, the, the um, to cut a long story short, the public inquiry found in favor of the road, 
But the Welsh government, there had been a change of um, Welsh government in the meantime, and the uh, First Minister, Mark Drakeford, overruled the public inquiry, overruled the inspector, and found in favour of preserving the Gwent levels. And that, for us, was a massive change, and it's, it's immense cause for optimism moving forward in Wales. I very often feel very lucky to be in Wales at the moment in terms of the way that the, the Welsh Government is putting climate and nature first. I mean, obviously, they're not perfect. But, but you had that, I mean, you, you know, that decision was made by Mark Drayford, and it's obviously a, a, a rare example of a politician making a right decision on something like that. But nonetheless, there's no way that would have happened if it wasn't for the, your campaign, was it? I mean, that, that absolutely built the context that meant Mark Drayford had to make that decision. I think I think so. I think mm. that we were we had tenacity. We just clung on. We went on and on and we made it as long and slow and painful a process for them as it as we possibly could and i think i, I recognize what Stu was saying about um about that road project about his road project being behind schedule mm. and i'd say to him you keep it behind schedule and you slow it down as much as you possibly can because every day that it goes behind schedule the cost mm. goes up mm. and it, there comes a tipping point where the cost is prohibitive and if you can just be as awkward as possible Bring a judicial review, even if you know you're going to fail, if you can do it because it'll slow it down, mm. and then they'll have to go back. And things are changing. Um, I think we were we were lucky, but I think it's also that we hung on and we used every means that we possibly could, which was a combination of community action, advocacy, a lot of political advocacy. And we, though I think there was a shift for us when we started to work with the politicians rather than just in combat, in conflict with them. And we started to say, look, you can do the right thing. You can be the good guys. What a wonderful thing you'll be doing if you save this precious uh, place of nature and don't put yeah. a road there. And in a way, you've really got the last laugh, haven't you, really, on this, I would say, Catherine, because the uh, you were saying before how first this was proposed back in the 1970s and there were campaigns in the 1980s and 1990s to stop it first time around. And, you know, what we often see with road schemes is there's sort of, some people call them zombie road schemes, is you think you've won them and then they pop up again. You think they're dead, but they pop up again and again and again. You kill them and kill them, but they keep popping up again. There's planners will have to keep bringing these road schemes back. But it was amazing, wasn't it? Because that fight, that decision by Mark Drayford in the end, he, he said that it was on climate change grounds as well, didn't he? Which is not, not an issue that's going to go away anytime soon. And uh, do you want to say a little bit more about what the Welsh Government announced earlier this this year about road building more generally? Well, yeah, they've placed a moratorium on road building. Um, they've Across also, the whole of Wales? Yeah, and they've also placed a moratorium on um, incinerators. So they're doing some great stuff. I mean, what we have in Wales is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which means that environmental concern considerations have to be taken on a par with other considerations, including economics. So you can, the, the economic argument doesn't trump all others. And unfortunately, in a lot of other places, the economic argument always does trump every other argument. So I think we're very fortunate um, in having that. I mean, we're not, I think we're still not actually dancing on the grave of that road because a change of administration could bring it back. So what we're trying to do now is to ensure that all the, the route that was earmarked for that road is now repurposed in such a way that if anybody did want to reintroduce the road, they'd have to go back to back to square one. So to actually mm. protect that, that mm. land. Um, mm. And if I can just say one other thing, which is a brilliant thing, and this is about community campaigners. A lot of community campaigning is done by individuals who just trailblaze. And there's a fantastic woman called uh, Caroline Antonio, who lives locally, who has been campaigning for, there's a little bit of land that was earmarked for the motorway, which was called the road to nowhere. nowhere. It's an actual just kind of dual carriageway, literally going nowhere, which became a fly tipping fly tipping city it was there was so much fly tipping you could literally see it from space it was awful she's campaigned to have that this is on the ground level she's campaigned for the local council to clear it up and she's repurposing she's rewilding it 
And it's fabulous to hear Stu talking about Rimrose being ex-landfill and the idea that nature will come back really fast. So that horrible fly tipping area that was originally earmarked for the, the relief road, the M4 relief road, is now going to become a rewilded place for the people of Newport and beyond. Amazing. So, um, well, we've got a little video, haven't we, to show just so people get a better uh, sense of this and of the uh, fight for the grant levels. And we've also later got a video that shows a bit more from Rimrose Valley as well, which we'll show at the end of the evening as well. But let's see the video now to understand a bit more about the amazing campaign to save grant levels. What is this life if full of care? We have no time to stand and stare. No time to stand beneath the boughs and stare as long as sheep or cows. No time to see when woods we pass where squirrels hide their nuts in grass. No time to see in broad daylight Streams full of stars like skies at night. No time to turn at beauty's glance and watch her feet, how they can dance. No time to wait till her mouth can Enrich that smile her eyes began A poor life this, if full of care We have no time to stand or stare Take time to visit the Gwent Levels. Stand and stay and immerse yourself in its breathtaking beauty. The Gwent Levels are home to rare wildlife, such as otters, water voles, dragonflies, and shrill carder bees. Time is running out for the Gwent Levels. The Welsh Government wants to build a new 14 mile long six lane motorway through Wales' equivalent of the Amazon rainforest. This would cut through the heart of this historic and beautiful landscape in South Wales. But you can help to save it. Get involved in the hashtag Save the Gwent Levels campaign. Hashtag no new M4. so good isn't it to see a campaign video from a campaign that's now being won absolutely fantastic that was just wonderful to hear from you Catherine thank you very much um I'm going to come back to Julian in a short moment just to get some of his reflections on what he's been hearing tonight uh, but first of all I'm going to put a poll to you because in the most recent Wild Lives we know you've really enjoyed uh, an opportunity to interact and to give us your thoughts on a poll so the question we want to ask you tonight is what would help you get involved with campaigns where you live? Would it be a step-by-step -step guide to running a campaign, networking opportunities with other campaigners, case studies from other individuals leading campaigns, or I'm not interested in getting involved in local campaigning. You, you can, uh, it'd be interesting to see if anyone clicks that, won't it? Um, you can, uh, you can only click one, I'm afraid, I think. Uh, which is a shame, but uh, it should be painful, but we like to put you through that agony uh, and wildlife, of course. So the poll, I think, is going up now uh, and on YouTube and do in, in the YouTube chat, do make sure you answer and we'll be giving you the results back shortly. So enjoy. Well, it's quite controversial, our polls and wildlife. Uh, they, 
just the fact that we're asking those questions. But anyway, uh, it will be very interesting to see what your answers are. Julian, back to you then. Um, you know, I'm sure you enjoyed as much as I did listening to these amazing campaigners here tonight Absolutely. telling us their stories. What did you what were your reflections on hearing from them? I mean, it brought back a, a heck of a lot of very, very fond memories for a start because I recognized in, in everybody's stories um, resonances and correspondences with various other places in different parts of the world and some of the places that were talked about tonight, you know, I, I, I know or I got to know, you know, fairly intimately. And I, I just wanted to pick up on something that a couple of people had mentioned, particularly as we've just finished with the Gwent levels there, which was a remarkable place to spend time in, this kind of ancient, magical, a place where I've never seen such extraordinary light for a start, and a place where the very first Welsh-born wild crane uh, was born in, in 400 years. Uh, you know, this place that Catherine so beautifully described in the videos kind of, you know, really, really brought home its sort of extraordinariness. Um, a species that was once common in the wetlands of Britain and was then extinct for, for many, many, many years, uh, centuries, sorry, uh, you know, right there on those quint levels that we've just seen, um, a crane chick was born, you know, in a place so, so threatened for such a long period of time. But somebody mentioned about, you know, so many of the kind of um, issues that we face is that the economy frequently trumps all else. And so many conversations I had really, really stunned me in many ways. And one of them, one of the most remarkable conversations I had, and this will follow on from something that Stu had mentioned, was on the Gwent levels with a group of children, because I'd gone pond dipping with a group of nine and 10 year olds who were there for an environmental education class. I love the pond dipping as much as they did, but I'm going to move beyond that to very quickly tell you that I asked them, I got permission from their teacher, if I could speak individually with these kids, nine and 10 years old, to find out what it was that they loved about the Gwent Levels. If they loved anything at all, I truly had no idea. They all loved it. And they all gave me individually the exact same two reasons. One, they loved it for the bugs and the birds and the bees that they would muck about with and see and find, and they would pond dip and find these extraordinary aquatic invertebrate species. That bit wasn't surprising. And remember that I spoke to all of these kids individually as we were walking through the reserve at Mager Marsh. But the second one really floored me because each and every child I spoke to said that they loved the peace and quiet of the Gwent levels. One said that when you know, when his parents had had a really busy time at work or might have been arguing a bit, they could find a little bit of peace and quiet. One said, when things are busy at school, I like to just be on my own and I can have the sky above me. Another said that it's just nice to sit with my thoughts in a green place. That goes against everything we're led to believe about our relationship with the natural world. Somehow the econo the, an economy has to, to trump all else, when in fact children are often far more intuitively connected to these deeper, deeper sensibilities and needs that the humans require. And here were these nine and 10 year olds articulating something that very, very few adults actually have the capacity to do that this space was so incredibly important to them and that they often need a little more than a place to have peace and quiet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's been lots of questions coming in tonight um, and uh, I'm going to throw a few out now and you can sort of um, uh, see how we answer them. There's a key question here, I think, for me from um, Adam Murray says, if leading a group, how do you ensure you do not burn out and keep the energy going. And, you know, Catherine, I really found myself thinking with the campaign on the, for the Gwent levels. I mean, you know, that was over a long time, wasn't it? And that you had to kind of keep that going. Um, how do you keep that energy going over such a long period of time? I mean, both you and Stu said that, you know, delay is your friend in one sense, you know, that's how you win these campaigns. It's really important, but that means you've got to keep that energy up somehow and that positivity. What's your top tips on that, Catherine, would you say? Well, I think um, we had probably a core of really, really committed people with different skills and they had also possibly different reasons um, for wanting to get involved. On a personal note, I, I took over as the chair of the campaign for a while, and then I had to go away to make a film. 
And so somebody else took over as chair. And when I came back, we shared the role. And I absolutely loved that. And in my new role with Friends of the Gwent Level, I share the, the chair with somebody else. And I think it's it's finding that you're not taking too much on your own shoulders, that you you make sure that you're you're supporting each other and that you've got some other really strong core people there. And we, I mean, we had immense support from the NGOs as well. I mean, it, it was it was a big campaign. Um, I think for smaller ones, you just I think you're just driven by fear of losing something. I think, you know, it's not necessarily the greatest thing to drive you, but it works. And just that panic that the thought of seeing a motorway going across somewhere that you love, you know, you don't sleep, about, you, you don't sleep at night, but it keeps you going. Well, I was going to ask. I was going to ask about that then, Catherine, a little bit. You know, the, the, the particularly with such a long campaign, you know, the, the personal toll it takes on you. You say you can't sleep at night. You know, this happening over so many years, you don't know if you're going to win or lose. In fact, you spend an awful lot of time thinking you're, you're going to lose. In, in What I've often observed with community campaigns is actually when you, uh, when you uh, very often when you look back with history, the, uh, the worst moments are just immediately before you win. <laughs> In a curious thing because it can sometimes look really desperate just before you win um yeah. but how, I mean, do, it was, how do you keep that going and and deal with that sort of the personal toll on it or um i i don't know i think people do burn out and i think i now look back and say oh it wasn't so bad it's a bit like childbirth isn't it you know afterwards you go it was all right <laughs> do it again um i think we were also lucky that that it, we didn't have that really terrifying um, moment of are we about to lose because there was this change taking place in Welsh and so we we realized that there was a whole shift in attitude and that the chances it seemed to get more and more clear that we were probably going to win so that kind of eased us out of it um, I don't know I, it's sometimes it's awful and I suppose you just have to think like anything else that you do that's really hard I don't have to do it I've made a choice. This is this is what I want to do. And I can walk away, but I don't want to. And I think probably mm -hmm. others feel the same way. You know, you, you are driven by something that you believe in. And, and then you can be just glad that you've got something that you believe in. Mm. Stu, what are your perspectives on this? I mean, you're still right in the midst of it in so many ways, but, you know, you've delayed it so long already. <laughs> so successful in that regard. But to keep, sort of keep going like that, it must be hard at times. It is hard at times, but um, you, you you need to be stubborn. Um, and knowing that you're in the right is you can draw a lot of encouragement from that. Um, and as I say, because um, the, the, our, the park's surrounded by about 90,000 people and our, and our little Facebook group, um, uh, for, for which it's not necessarily about the campaign, the Facebook group, but all it will take is one person posting um an anecdote about a, a, a walk that they've had or an animal they encountered on their trip. And while you're bogged down in, you know, writing um, passive aggressive emails to politicians <laughs> or certain politicians, it, all it takes is that to snap you out of it and say, yeah, this is why we're doing it. Um, but the point that Catherine made as well about having a team, um, I think I'm, I, I think a lot of us are guilty sometimes of, of thinking I'll take more on myself. Or I'll, I'll, I'll do it this way. But we have got a great core team. Um, and all you have to do is put your hand up and ask for help. Um, and if you need to take reclaim a little bit of time back with your family and um, to stop those sleepless nights, um, that's what you've got to do. Um, and, and Stu, your core team, are they, are, they, are they people that knew each other before there was this threat to the park? Or is it that you've, you've got to know each other in response to this, that you've, you've, you've uh, you know, developed those relationships and built this kind of community and this kind of friendship a group of people fighting this campaign you know really in response to the threat was it a bit, yeah. of, bit of each a bit of each but i'd say more so the latter because um i don't i don't I think i think it's unlikely that many of us would cross paths uh had it not been for the campaign um and that's what i actually love about it i think if the, the one message i would well one of the main messages i would like to get out of tonight is if you're in hesitating is to think oh i care about this but should i should i get involved with that group or should i even start a group go for it it'd be it's hand on heart the best thing you'll ever do and in my case as i say i was new to the area um, and it's helped integrate me in the community 
um, with people, um, you know, some amazing people. I hope I've made friends for life in the process and that they feel the same as well. But also you've got your core team, but then, you know, bumping into people in the streets saying, uh, love what you're doing, we're supporting it, uh, supporting the campaign. It really, that's what gives you, that's what makes you keep going. Um, and that's what will always make us keep going, I think. Um, and I'm sure it's true for lots of the other panellists too. I mean, I've observed this so many times. I just find it so sort of beautifully ironic that you people will come together to fight these horrific developments or horrific road schemes or anything, and then build lifetime friendships out of it yeah. and stronger communities as a result of it. It is quite extraordinary. Trish, you're just sort of you're one year into your campaigning with uh, and your work with Wild NG, but you know, are you seeing that kind of coming together of community uh, around what is in that case, you know, a positive agenda in many respects, uh, but also then fighting the glyphosate. As well I, I i mean what you know what, what's happened with us you know echoes what what others have said really about the sort of firstly about the core team um we have taken on a lot we're all working full-time in our private lives but we're doing this voluntarily we can't do that without that collection of really passionate people who've got really different skills that come together and that sort of does really help you know so, and and we've really designed our projects so it, it really is flexible to understanding that we can't give all the time that we need to look after ourselves and contribute as we can and passionately when we can as well and that's really helped us with our project you know people we can go to like pick up the phone which was mentioned earlier absolutely and you know we've got sort of people who work within the field of sort of like getting baseline data for us for example or getting the science to back up our campaigns and then that's fueled through our yeah our, our sort of social media you know listening to Dave and his Facebook page and Stuart as well you know we've we have had people come up to us in the street going we love what you're doing you know and we're sort of really in the early days and we do hope we fulfill but we've we've come to the idea that whatever happens we are trying and that's our motto you know if you don't try it won't change nothing will change and through that trying we want to offer really positive opportunities so we feel that whatever happens we won because we're moving direction and that's that's key to our message so we don't put all of the pressure on ourselves we just keep going with it and enjoy it um but as also, which was said about being stubborn, that's definitely what we're doing too. We're not going to, you know, we are going to be very vocal at the same time. Excellent. Good. Dave, it, it looks like you've pulled together large numbers of people around those Hen Harrier days. Is, do you see that that's, is that forming a, a sort of core of people that come back and keep working on the issue? Oh, sorry, you're on mute, Dave, actually. Oh, well, that's it. Uh, Great. Okay, cheers. Um, yeah, I mean, I've come in on the back of other people running Hen Harrier days. Uh, but, yeah, there is a core of people that definitely come to the days. And you can see them going to different other ones around the region. Uh, you'll see them in photos from other one, uh, one further afield as well. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I measure my success really on how many likes things get and shares and how many followers I've got so that I know that I can get that message where it needs to be. Really. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it's also harder for me as well because I do what I do pretty much on my own, mm. apart from my family and one or two people who tag along to sort of be a marshal or a litter picker at the odd event. That's all my team is. And so I don't have the luxury of uh, being able to let other people uh, pick up where I leave off on one of my projects. But I've often found that I've often found that Dave is, uh, you know, often you get these amazing mm. sort of people coming together into communities and campaigning. But sometimes you'll also yeah. get sort of individuals that have, you know, really ploughed us a particular foe yeah. for a long time and focused on an issue and made it mm. um, and and done that. You know, it, there's a good, strong tradition of that as well, I think, in this kind of campaigning. Yeah, certainly is. Yeah. Great. Well, we've had the results of the poll come in. I'm very pleased to say we asked you all watching tonight what would help you get involved with campaigns where you live. Uh, uh, going from bottom up first, uh, 0% of you said I'm not interested in campaigning. That's good. That's probably why you're watching tonight. So, but it's good to check that. Uh, 
27% of you said case studies from other campaigners would be really helpful. Uh, 34% of you said a guide to running a campaign, a step-by-step -step guide to running a campaign would be helpful. And 39% uh, was the winner. 39% networking opportunities with other campaigners. No big surprise there. And of course, uh, the point is that's much easier to do now than it once was because of the sort of digital age and so on. Uh, many of you were talking tonight how you've all used digital platforms to help drive your campaigning and not just campaigning in the digital space at all, but using digital to help network people come together and build that kind of uh, uh, working together locally. But also, I think some of you talked about how you were learning from each other and learning from other campaigns uh, on digital platforms and, and reaching out. I mean, Stu, you said you've obviously networked up with um, other groups and, and transport campaigners in particular, sort of nationally in learning that. I mean, how do you... Uh, uh, Tell us a little bit more about how you use the sort of digital platforms and so on to build those networks. Yeah, um, it, well, in, in, in that case, um, or in that instance, it was um, an organisation, a, a relatively new NGO called uh, Transport Action Network, um, headed up by Chris and Becca. They're uh, brilliant people. They've been fighting road campaigns for much, much longer than, uh, than pro cumulatively probably everybody on this call. But uh, and what they do... Um, they coordinate. Uh, uh, it's 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 obviously it's it's about it's an organisation championing sustainable transport, but unfortunately, combating roads is a big part of their work. So just earlier this year, um, we're in the strange position in our campaign that we're we're a nationally significant infrastructure project, uh, and yet it's it hasn't really got underway. They held a consultation, they announced the route, uh, and then we've had this years of delay. So we're in this position of we're four years in, but we're still none the wiser really what. And NSIP is, or the kind of things that are around the corner for us. Um, so what they did was bring a load of groups together, um, as existing campaigns and and previous campaigns, and we talked about what experiences they'd had, what kind of documents they they need they'll need to review, um, and all of that is just invaluable information. Um, and that's that's where we pick up on these similar stories about national highways tactics and dare I say incompetence in certain things, and we learn. Yeah, to look out for the same thing, and so there's so many common stories. What will be what will be your top tip then? Uh, we've had a question from Joan Hardingham here. She said, "Do you have any advice to campaigners against large national infrastructure projects such as her local one, Sizewell C Nuclear Power Station?" Um, you know, what will be the top tips? What do you say the things you really learned when fighting sort of such large national infrastructure projects? Um, know your stuff. Um, that is vitally important. Um, gauge public opinion um, for what the arguments are. If you, don't, if, you, if you might have an idea, as I said before, you might have an idea what's important to you, but you'd be surprised what's important to other people. And then you can draw all those sorts of arguments in. Um, I think personally, if you're fighting an NSIP that, that, that you've really got your work cut out and we have, but I, I, I find that part of the fun, to be honest. We're, you know, we're taking on the, the national government and in effect, what we want to try and do is bring about policy, so policy change. So what that involves is if you're, if you're fighting big beasts, like whether it's Department for Transport or National Highways or Peel Ports, you, your communications need to be as good as, if not better, than theirs. And that, might not, that doesn't involve necessarily uh, you know, spending an absolute fortune, but agitate, don't be nice. Um, and I remember that, uh, a, a local resident, who, uh, Gary, who joined our campaign, he, he came essentially give us, a, give us a pitch, really, sort of, saying, you know, if, if nice letters and, and please don't do this, it's, it's not going to get you anywhere. So out-message them, um, be fun. That's what I, in fact, actually, if being sort of a bit irreverent and anarchic and that, that is, can keep you engaged. You know, you think, I'm just going to pick on them for a few days. And I don't mean individuals, just poke fun at the establishment and the organisations that are behind these insane, environmentally destructive uh, <laughs> proposals. So there, there's a few tips. <laughs> Okay, very good. I think that's right. Having a bit of fun as you do it is crucially important for sort of keeping keeping things going. Um, just on this point, though, there was a really important question from Lewis Clark. Said, "My sister is fighting to save a local ancient copse. The landowner is quite a threatening man. How should she best deal with such a person?" And you got a sense of that. You know, sometimes it is actually the other side can get really quite nasty at times. Um, how do you deal with that? Would you say? One of you. I mean, you talked there, Stuart, about using a bit of 
humor but i mean um what's any any sort of advice from people there about about that can i just say that i think in addition to what Stu was saying and it might it might be relevant for the cops i think finding political allies is really mm. important and once when you get those because there it's amazing how many politicians who, who might have uh political views that you think are totally a posing your own in certain respects might actually support your campaign mm. um, and if you can find anybody because it gives them the opportunity to look good if if they can if they can show that they've got a cuddly side or a you know loving nature side um, I think the the other thing is that um, finding the arguments as Stu was saying about being being cleverer and on message and maybe finding the arguments, this thing about the economy and so on, is that I think there's so much more that we can bring out of um, economic theory about how well-being actually facilitates the economy as well. Mm. And the idea of access to green spaces, for example, how that will have a, an almost direct impact on the cost of mental health care, for example, um, that that you know, doing your research in that, I think really helps so that, so that it's getting as far away as possible from being that awful kind of Hessian lentil image that so many politicians will still throw back at environmental campaigners and being, being much smarter and, and detailed and scientific about it. Yeah. You know, if I could just follow on from, from, please Pat do Julian. Yeah. There is that, um, in response to the, the recent question as well as is that it's also really important to remember i think that these often these green place spaces sorry that are under threat there are contemporary commons in the sense that they're often very very democratic because people attach to them for often extraordinarily different reasons some people might go there to go bird watching others for simply exercise others to photograph wildflowers others to sit and read a book there are a lot of different ways into a green place and what that means is that you can build solidarity through those different connective nodes in a web in a way, by appealing to those very, very uses. So you can build up a greater coalition of connection simply through that varied um, range of attachments. So in response to the question about the ancient cops, I would also suggest trying to locate as many people locally who might not really see the place simply because it's a rich uh, spot of biodiversity, but just love a 10 minute stroll there on a Sunday afternoon because mm. It's a nice, peaceful place to be. So to try and really lock into the multitudinous nature of these green places in terms of how people respond to them. Absolutely. Well, look, I can't believe it, but we are uh, fast running out of time tonight now. We're almost about to wrap up. And I personally, I could feel like that we could carry on this conversation for hours, but we do have to finish. So I'm going to come to each of you as the sort of uh, campaigners in turn. Uh, and then finish with Julian, um, just uh, particularly for you as campaigners, if for people that are trying to fight something locally near where they live um, or indeed fight for something locally. Uh, I mean, you know, I was struck by your work. Trish is also, you know, trying to get that positive agenda about putting nature and recovery through streets and so on. Um, you know, what's the one bit of advice you'd really give to people that are thinking, mm, you know, I'd like to change something around where I live, stop something or start something? Uh, what would what would you say? Um, Trish, let's start with you. Um, I would just say do it. Um, don't be afraid. Bite the bullet. Fuel your own passion and get a few people around you to get it going. Um just small steps, you know, I think that like hearing everybody around the sort of table today sort of saying that they didn't do this before. <laughs> it's just sort of like they weren't expected to be finding themselves fighting for this piece of land or, and it's just like, it's the everyday, it's us, it's, we're a community and you will not regret it. You will not regret it. Like you say, networks, friendships, communities are formed through campaign. And it is so, so rejuvenating and positive individually and collectively for your community. So no fear. Go for it. Just start. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Dave, what about you? I mean, you, you know, your sense of this, what was the sort of one bit of advice you'd give people that are thinking of trying to shake things up a little? I think... 
find a novel way to take ownership of what you're trying to fight for. Um, we've seen the pictures of people writing labels of what plant species are on pavements. Um, I've got and Harry a puppet here that I can take around different places um, to sort of take a photo to really uh, resonate with people about where a hen harrier maybe disappeared. But also, like, if there's a woodland that's under threat, uh, find a way of taking ownership of that but in a slightly different way. Like, I started a litter pick at Smithy Wood that Julian Hoffman wrote about. Um, we couldn't go into the wood, but we could clear the verges around the woodland of litter. And we showed the council, other people in the area, that people care for that woodland, and we could potentially help the owners to run it properly as a conservation woodland. Uh, just have an idea. If you've got an idea, run with it, and mm. hopefully other people will follow. Mm. Absolutely. Catherine, what would you say to anyone trying to start out on on trying to run a local campaign i think i would say that it's a it's actually a massive adventure and if you can embrace it as um as an exciting challenge and not just as something awful that you have to do you learn so much along the way you you enhance your knowledge of so many things whether it's you know planning law or biodiversity or, or whatever you you learn a lot and you grow as a human being through doing it Fantastic. Stu, what about you? Oh, you're mute, sorry, Stu. Am I? That's better. Yeah. <laughs> I just echo what everybody else said, really. Um, you Don't regret it. Don't look back and think, if only I'd tried to stop that road or if only I'd tried to save that wood. Um, just go for it. And because you will uh, meet some amazing people, you'll have some amazing experiences, whether that's going down to Westminster and meeting a politician or doing a little bit of media... And I think if ever there's, the zeitgeist has been in our favour, it's now. Um, you know, the, the world has woken up to the climate emergency and our children are ahead of us on all of that. Um, and I think it, it would be amazing to look back and say, yeah, I was part of that movement and, and I played my small part. Um, so go for it and you will not regret it. Absolutely. And Julian, just... Uh... Help us reflect on what we've been hearing tonight. Uh, just some uh, a handful of examples here of those extraordinary, ordinary people. Uh, and it, and, and the, one of the reasons I so loved your book, Irreplaceable, is because I don't. I've long felt that this story doesn't get told enough. You know, I, ironically, because these community campaigners are so good about campaigning on the issue they're fighting on, that's often what makes the headline rather than the story the campaigners behind it which i think came out so strongly in your book but they 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 are extraordinary stories aren't they yeah absolutely and you know i think tonight we've had a wonderful snapshot of of the extraordinary diversity both of places that are often under threat but also of voices you know it's this kind of testament to voices that can come together and i think i would what i would love to wrap up with because we saw for about 15 or 20 seconds in the wonderful video uh, from the Gwent levels, we saw a starling murmuration. And this mm. is an idea that the murmuration runs through irreplaceable as a sort of metaphor, because I very early on while writing that book, I realized that that extra, and I hope by the way, that for everybody watching tonight and feel free to add in the comments where your favorite murmuration, if you've got access to a, a local starling murmuration, because that extraordinary spectacle in the winter sky at dusk is a remarkably potent force. The way it moves, the way it shifts, the way it turns, the way it weaves. But studies have shown, particularly studies from, from Italy and Rome, that a murmuration, each and every single starling inside a murmuration is only connected to its seven nearest neighbors. Outside of that small unit, there's nothing. Each and every deaf movement is solely in response to its seven nearest neighbors. And what I realized is that these campaigns, they're like a murmuration in many ways because change can begin with single voices and it could be yours, could be mine, it could be hers, his, it could be anybody here. But it's through that sense of cohesion, it's through that sense of joining together that we also empower others. We empower others who might be 
demoralized or fearful or concerned about things or feeling that there's nothing that they can really do to change the facts on the ground. But actually what I learned while spending time with campaigners is that all it takes is one or two voices. All it takes is those seven near neighbors, those seven starlings, and suddenly you grow into something far, far bigger, far more powerful, far more potent and capable of enormous transformative change. And through that, we become a chorus, we become a coalition, and ultimately, as people, we become a murmuration. So I think I would close that. Oh, beautiful, Julian. What a wonderful way to close. And there's been wonderful comments coming in here. I find it quite moving, actually. Leslie Green saying, thank you, inspiring. Simon saying, it's the ordinary people who are going to save the planet ultimately. There's enough of us. Jenny Floyd saying, thanks, everyone. This gives me hope. Lewis Clark says, what an inspiring session this has been. Many thanks. Angie Neal, thanks all. Brilliant. Beverly Fleet, thanks. Very helpful, informative, and perhaps my favourite, Annabelle. I'd like to buy all these wonderful campaigners a large drink if I could. And cheers to you all. Keep going and being brilliant. Well, we're going to play out. We want to obviously play out with uh, trying to help one of the live campaigns that is still going. And uh, you've heard from Stu Bennett tonight about that fight is still going on to protect Rimrose Valley up in Liverpool from that appalling dual, ca dual carriageway, which is planned for it. So thank you so much for watching tonight. Thank you for all your comments. Please share this on social media. It's live on YouTube the moment we've finished and share it, share it amongst uh, all your friends to make sure that they watch this episode of Wildlife as well. But as we play out, let's just watch about the campaign to save Wimrose Valley. Thank you very much. Good night. And thanks to all the wonderful panellists, to Julian, to Stu, to Dave, to Trish and Catherine. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.